Right. And our next presenter um, is Mel Anderson from Idaho State University. My father is serving two life sentences for 11 counts of child abuse, including rape and torture, that culminated in my brother's murder. Critical trauma theory and literature posits that for survivors like me, trauma is both unremembered and unspoken. I disagree. I remember every moment and can speak it, and I'm not alone. After the Holocaust, psychologist David Boder recorded the oral testimony of death camp survivors. Survivors who wanted to speak were plentiful, but no one would publish Boder's research until nearly 40 years after his death because, quote, no one wants to hear atrocity. Survivors spoke. They were not heard. The very existence of Holocaust memoir, which requires both memory and voice to write, severely undercuts the belief that memory and voice do not survive trauma. Supported by tens of thousands of Holocaust narratives, my research argues for a new theoretical framework in which we shift the conversation away from survivor deficiency and towards the silence imposed by listener discomfort. The problem with trauma communication is not expressive, but receptive. Truly, no one wants to hear atrocity. Beyond the therapy circle and happy ending tropes, it's never the time or the place, and some of us don't get happy endings. It's never the time or the place to speak the very real traumas that exist in the shadow of racism, sexism, homophobia, bereavement, rape, suicide, war, or the myriad other traumas that humans face every day. This is evident when we ban books that are honest about the suffering of the Holocaust, or even when we forbid teaching U.S. history because it might, in the words of one new law, cause discomfort. Auschwitz survivor Primo Levi described a compulsion to speak after trauma, to make the rest participate. But when we teach that survivors are incapable of speech, we remove the imperative to listen, and we lose the opportunity to learn from those experiences that, while painful, are also valuable. I want the circumstances that made my survival necessary to be fixed. That can't happen while we persist in the ableist notion that survivors are too broken to participate. We can speak. My research invites others to learn to listen, even when it's uncomfortable. Thank you. So I would say yours is one of the most personal um, research uh, projects here. And I guess I'd just like to know, um, was there a time when your personal experience came together with a teacher or a mentor or a faculty member that inspired you to put those together? OK, two things. One, um, I served in the Army for a while. And in that function, I was able to actually go to a speech um, where Fanny Eisenberg, who survived Auschwitz, spoke. Um, and at the very end of her presentation, she asked for any questions. And I'd never been in the room with someone whose story was like, <laughs> you know, I couldn't think, oh, okay, yeah, I've been there. It was like the first time. And so I asked her, after an experience like that, how do you learn to talk about the weather? And she put her hand over her heart and she said, oh, honey, you felt pain, haven't you? <laughs> And she said that after that kind of trauma, you'd never learn to talk about the weather. You just find other people who also can't talk about the weather. Um, and she talked about just being able to talk about this. And I, I've realized over the years that like, when I kind of say something about my own past, you know, I get that, ha ah, ha, <laughs> like cringe. Um, and it made me really think. So in my first semester, when I, when I read this theory that you can't speak trauma or remember it. I was like, oh, well, that's not true, buddies. <laughs> and I've really devoted a lot of time to it since then. Well, I appreciate it. I think what you're doing is trying to reinforce what we all need to do is be better listeners. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you.